Hey everybody, this is Bill Inman. Welcome, we're glad to have you for a brief interview with Jim Janeski. Uh, Jim is the Managing Director at Corporate Fuel, and uh, he spent 20 years as a research analyst, most of that with the staffing industry. And now at Corporate Fuel, as a Managing Director, um, he's helped guiding staffing companies through the M&A process and, and other transactions. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Jim. Over the past year or so, I found him to be a great guy, great partner in the industry, and, and has given some great guidance to me. So, Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. My pleasure, Bill. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple questions for you. Uh, obviously, the topic today is going to be about the state of mergers and acquisitions in the industry, and, and I'm sure you have some great strategic thoughts on the industry as a whole as well. So, again, we appreciate your time. If it's not too much trouble, would you mind giving us a little bit of your, of your background, maybe a little bit more detail, and tell us about Corporate Fuel? Sure, Bill. Um, as you mentioned, I um, run the business services practice at Corporate Fuel Advisors, uh, which includes staffing. Uh, Corporate Fuel Advisors is a middle market uh, M&A, merger and acquisition advisory. We also raise capital, um, both on the debt and equity side. Um, and we also have the leadership recruitment uh, offering. And as you mentioned, uh, prior to coming to Corporate Fuel as a M&A and strategic advisor, I spent uh, about 20 years on Wall Street as an equity research analyst, writing research on companies like Robert Half, Manpower, Monster, LinkedIn. And then I decided to uh, move over to Corporate Fuel um, some years ago. Great. Yeah, it was, it was surprising to me. We were both at a conference together in San Diego about a month ago. I was just blown away about how many people you knew there. And it was an executive level conference and, and all the big wigs, quote unquote. And you're obviously well networked. So not only have you been in the game a long time, obviously you're an important advisor to many people. So if thank it's, you. yeah, thank you. Uh, if, it, if it's not too much uh, trouble, I'll just jump into a few questions, if that's okay with you. I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts. I'll, sure I'll, I'll just ask you uh, to start off with, what do you think the most important current trends are in the staffing industry today? Sure, Bill. The most important for the IT, engineering, and medical staffing verticals in that order, especially IT, are the proposed restrictions on H-1B visas. So far, while no legislation has been passed, there are some uh, leg there is some legislation on the table that could make the IT staffing industry, especially, uh, at a, could put it at a tremendous competitive advantage um, versus uh, the actual tech companies themselves. Right now, there's just been a suspension of what's called premium processing, which is when someone is on and working. Uh, in the United States on an H-1B visa, if they're done with their assignment and want to move on to another project, uh, used to be uh, about two weeks. And now they suspended that process and it's created a real chill over the entire industry. When you look at the other verticals outside of those three areas, really what, what, what's on executives' mind is, number one, the pace and amount of infrastructure investment. Um, will we have tax reform, and what is the timing, and other economic type of stimulus issues, and, and, and what is the timing and the extent of all those. That's really what's on their minds. That's really interesting. So overall, as we've changed presidents here, a lot of those policies are, are, are big issues and big ideas affecting the industry today, obviously H-1B being the, the most important one you mentioned. Right. Some are positive for the industry, and, and, and some are, are very negative. Great. Well, I know that uh, in your previous life, quote unquote, you tracked a lot of the publicly traded staffing companies like Robert Half you mentioned. What, what are you seeing in the publicly traded markets for staffing at this point? Well, since the election, Bill, we have seen the staffing stocks as an entire group move up um, quite considerably on an order of magnitude of some 50%, okay? And that's the so-called Trump trade. Uh, and the Trump trade had to do with any types of companies that could be beneficiaries of better economic growth, more investment, uh, things of that nature. But there, prior to the election, 
there was a market slowdown as we progressed through 2016 in just about every vertical. And the fourth quarter of 2016, when it was reported publicly by the, the publicly traded staffing companies, the results were kind of so-so. So when you have a situation where stocks are going up as earning estimates are actually coming down, uh, that's not normal for, for the stock market. So my feelings are that valuations uh, of these publicly traded stocks, and then that trickles into the private markets as well, um, they could come under pressure if estimates start to come down and there are concerns about whether or not some of the new administration's policies will get implemented. We saw how health care reform really failed, and so there, there are questions uh, around that. The publicly traded companies will be reporting their first quarter results and giving us an outlook for the second quarter and in some cases beyond over the next month, and that'll give us an idea of, of what the underlying trends in the market are. Okay, that's good feedback, Jim. Obviously, a 50% jump in such a short period of time is pretty overwhelming and not something that, that hits our industry very often. So it'll be interesting to see how all this pans out. Now, as we listen to this, or as you listen to this, um, this is obviously April uh, 2017, just to be clear. And you mentioned the first quarter numbers are in and, and looked at the revenue of the last as well. So what are you seeing as kind of the trickle-down effect from the publicly traded companies and how it's affecting the M&A market, which obviously impacts a lot of the mid-market staffing companies as well? Sure. The M&A market is still robust. Uh, there's more buyers than sellers, and there still is um, very good access to of both the debt and equity capital markets. The multiples in, uh, of companies in the private market when they sell or when someone is looking at buying another company, they depend upon many factors with high-end professional services companies with strong growth rates, very good margins. They're getting the best valuation. I would say the highest valuations are, are, are reserved for um, HR technology companies um, who are getting valuations uh, of uh, very high valuations, I should say, of revenues because a lot of them don't necessarily have a, a profits or a significant amount of profits. So it, overall, uh, the M&A market is still very good. Okay, good to hear. Thanks for the clarity on that, Jim. I know a lot of the companies that I speak to, um, a lot of the owners, I should say, in the mid-market uh, are putting their feelers out there. And what do, what do they need to do if, if we want to give them some guidance to plan for an exit or a merge? What, what do these owners and these C-level executives need to do to plan for those transactions? Well, the first thing, Bill, is that you should select a financial advisor to guide you through the process sooner rather than later. It's not something that we necessarily advise you to do at the end of when you've made a decision to move forward, but do it before you decide to move forward so that person can guide you and advise you through the steps. Um, the first step we consider is evaluation of strategic alternatives. Do I want to sell my whole company? Do I want to sell a majority interest in it? Do I want to do a management buyout? Things of, uh, of that nature. The second is, what are my expectations for a sale? Do I have a multiple of EBITDA, for example, or a multiple of revenues in mind that might be out of line of current industry trends? What type of structure do you want in the transaction? Are you willing to accept uh, equity? Are you willing to take on a seller's note? That would be the second step. Third step is get your financials in order. It makes the process much better, and it, and it won't deter away from the valuation. The last thing is, is determine with your advisor, what are the investment highlights about your company that you want to that you want to highlight during the process. Uh, and, and then last, um, have the advisor manage the process for you, uh, and that's the best way that we found that you can maximize value with your firm. Yeah, having been through that process before, Jim, I, I, I realized that having the advisor who often has different relationships with the contacts, the acquiring partner or the funding partner um, is key. So that makes sense. Are you finding that a lot of these owners are prepared for that process when they come to you, or are they finding themselves unprepared? 
Um, well, a lot of times the owners are not necessarily prepared for the process. And I think that part of the reason is that their expectations may be out of line um, and some they don't realize necessarily the time involved with it. And then they're not really sure about how the process works and what the timing is of, of each step. So to walk you through that briefly, the first thing that we do when, when we advise or uh, engage a client is we do preparation work where we get to know the ins and outs of the company and the industry uh, inside out and upside down, okay? And then we prepare a memorandum and we start to contact potential buyers when we're doing a sell side assignment. After that, we assess what the interest is of various buyers and we take a look at what their, we get an indication of interest, uh, we determine what valuation they are looking to offer, we take a look at what type of structure of the transaction they want to do. Um, and then in the next step, we do due diligence where we'll have management meetings, uh, either conference calls and then in-person meetings, and that's where we get final bids. Um, after that, once we determine which bid we're going to take, um, we negotiate the transaction and work with our client and their lawyer and their accountant in order to close the transaction. So this can take anywhere from six to nine months or more, depending upon the level of interest, the complexity of the transaction, and uh, where we are in the cycle. Six to nine months from the day they contact you uh, is basically the general time. No, uh, Bill, that's a that. Thanks for uh, asking that. No, that's from the preparation. Um, it sometimes is years from the date they contact us because they may or not, may not be ready, right? Uh, so this is when uh, we're engaged and we're now uh, going through the process of selling a company. Okay. Now, I, I, I imagine all of the big players are constantly looking for great partners to acquire. Jim, how do you stay in touch and, and understand the timing and, and the needs of all the smaller players who may want to acquire companies? It must just, your Rolodex must just be huge and you're always on the phone to talk to the buyers to see who's, who's ready. Yeah, you, Bill, you do have to kind of keep your ear to the ground. I, I think my background as an analyst has helped me do that uh, clearly. That's what at least our clients are telling us. And so you have to keep your ear to the ground to find out what are the multiples. You could advise your, your, your companies and your clients, you know, if you're expecting this multiple and you're in this vertical, uh, that may not be aligned. So yes, you do have to keep your ear to the ground, and you have to do a lot of uh, uh, a lot of pressing flesh and phone calls, as you mentioned, and um, just making sure that you're keeping up on on trends and and what executives at at all sizes of companies are thinking. That's great, Jim. Uh, thank thanks so much for the information. I'm hoping that we can make this a regular occurrence and and talk to you quarterly and. You talk to so many different players at all different types of uh, titles and positions. It'd be great to get an update from you. But really appreciate this information. I know that uh, you can be reached at Jim at CorporateFuel.com. And wherever this is posted, we'll make sure to post your contact information. So, Jim, uh, thank you so much for the time. We wanted to keep this one brief just so the owners and the, the executives who are listening to this can kind of squeeze in, get, get a quick update, and learn all this great stuff. So, again, appreciate your time, Jim. Thank you, Bill. My pleasure.